Daniel 4. Sister Laura was right. It is a long passage. Okay. But did you hear the beginning? King Nebuchadnezzar to all peoples and languages and nations that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the most high God has done for me. What a testimony. Huh? The great pagan king publishes a letter to all the world to testify to the sovereign power and goodness of the one true God. One, oh, the kids are gone, but one true God. You all remember them? That they might know what he has come to know, and we should know it. But even better than what God showed to this king is whom God has shown to us. For while King Nebuchadnezzar testifies to us of God's work in his life, it is King Jesus who reveals God to us through his life. Amen? Jesus is the revelation of the Most High God, the King of heaven, and what's more, he is the lowliest of men. He was humbled and is exalted by God, not so that he might just tell everyone about it, but that they might share in it with him, that his testimony might be ours. In him, we have a better testimony. Amen? Amen. Just like last time, there it is. There's a sermon. All right. Let us pray. We praise and extol and honor you, God Most High, the only God, for all your works are right and all your ways are just, and you humble the proud, but give grace to the humble. Humble us, all of us, to hear and obey you. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And all God's people said, amen. So we're preaching through the book of Daniel to be reminded of and trust in the sovereignty of God over all things. Especially in this time of seeming uncertainty, of obvious unrest, we must remember and rehearse the surety of God's sovereignty. How fortunate for us, then, that this book of Daniel just repeats this theme over and over again. The God of Israel alone is God. He alone is sovereign and is sovereign over all the things that are happening to them, even those things that seem towards their destruction. But he will deliver his faithful people out of them all. But each new iteration brings new contour, right? Last week, we heard of God's sovereign power to deliver his people. Now we hear of God's sovereign power to humble and exalt, to bring down and to build back up. And so as with last week, the story matters, or rather the genre matters. And what is the genre of the passage that we just heard. It's a letter. It's a published letter of a king. It's a testimony, right? It's a testimony to God's work in a man's life. And like all testimonies, it's meant to be heeded, to be trusted, and acted on accordingly. So what are we to make of this testimony? So I want to say two things. Primarily, okay? First, we have a good testimony from King Nebuchadnezzar. All right? It's from King, but more so it's from, the, from God. From God himself given to us. What God communicated to him, he communicated through him to us. And we may not want to learn it in the same way that King Nebuchadnezzar did, but we do need to learn it Nonetheless, that God alone rules and he humbles the proud. We have to trust him on this, okay? 
But the second thing, we have a far greater testimony from King Jesus. We need to trust in him. Amen? It's one thing to be pointed to God and say, he's what he's done for me. It's another thing for God to come to you, walk up to you and say, here is what I am doing for you. The God whom we are to know of has made himself known in Jesus Christ. He is the revelation of the true God and the true king and of true man. We must be united to him in his humility if we want to be united to him in his exaltation. And so that's where we'll want to conclude. That's where we'll want to go. That united to the true King Jesus, the better king, the better testimony, we will know not only God's sovereign power to humble, but to exalt. Amen. So first of all, we need to learn from King Nebuchadnezzar's testimony. And what is it? You know, really, I mean, if you listen, his testimony is rather remarkably easy to follow, right? He tells us right up front, and he tells us again at the end. Verses 34, 37, did you see that? At the end of my days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason was restored to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. And what's more, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor God Most High, the King of Heaven, for all his works are right, and his ways are just. And he is able to humble those who walk in pride. And how does Nebuchadnezzar do this? Oh, how does he know this? Well, one, God told him so. <laughs> but then two, God acted so. He humbled him. That's why he knows it. Let's look at that. One, God told him so. God communicated this testimony first to Nebuchadnezzar. Three times, okay? Three times. Did you hear in the passage, right? First in a dream starting verse 17, second in Daniel's interpretation, in verse 25, and then directly in a voice from heaven, verse 32, Nebuchadnezzar is told that the Most High God rules over the kingdoms of men and gives them to whom he will. Now, if I told you some sort of like horror story of holiday travel, for example, that the place I was trying to go four hours away actually took me 20-something hours to get to because of the terrible like circumstances of traffic and weather and whatever. But then I told you that beforehand, um, I had heard that there was going to be a lot of traffic from the news. I had been told by someone who just came up from that way that the traffic was really bad and you don't want to go that way. And then as I drove there, there were detour signs aplenty telling me not to go that way. But I decided to go that way anyway. You might say, well, sounds like you should have known that, bro. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was told many a time, okay? He had plenty of indication of what was true. So why is God telling Nebuchadnezzar this? I mean, one, apparently, it's he's a human king who doesn't get it. That's why these words all come with the sentence, until you know. He doesn't live as though this is true. He sets himself up, and thus he is called proud. Now, he's a king, so it's quite relevant to him that God rules the kingdoms. But what about to us? Do we know this? Do we trust God? That he rules the kingdoms, the nations, the states, the counties, 
the institutions of the world and gives them to whom he will? Do we trust that no one has power to wield influence or policies or the pen or the sword unless God has given it to them? Unless he has allowed it? And I say aloud, because God sets up rulers who are wicked sometimes. But that does not mean that God endorses their wickedness. Sometimes he sets up wicked rulers for their own destruction or for the humbling of his people. King Nebuchadnezzar was anointed by God to destroy Jerusalem. We're all sinners, and power corrupts all the more. It doesn't mean that God endorses our sinfulness in power, but it does mean that God is sovereign and works through the actions that we may take. Nothing is meaningless because God rules in heaven. And I know that this can be hard, and it may even hurt, because we have been hurt. And there is so much that could be said about this. Whole courses and series of sermons and books have been written to help comfort the saints in this. And there's a lot to say that I can't say in all of it, but I want us to hear, we may not know the meaning, but we know the one who gives meaning. Amen? Okay. It may be to humble us, but it's certainly for our hope. Certainly for our hope. So one, God told him so, but two, God acted so, right? This is how Nebuchadnezzar learned. He didn't learn because God told him. He learned because God acted upon him. The real thrust of this testimony is what God communicates through Nebuchadnezzar, what the king saw in the dream. The beautiful and glorious tree cut down and shackled at the stump. What the king heard from Daniel. It is you, O king. His greatness to be chopped down, even though he was given counsel to repent. What he saw sort of flashed in a moment from a divine voice. The kingdom will depart from you. Everything that was foretold happened. Truth is truth, but experience matters, doesn't it? We say, for example, God is good all the time, and all the time, right? And it's one thing to say that on a Sunday morning. It's true. It's another thing, I know, to say it when your baby boy is in the NICU, and your wife is crying, and your basement is flooding. And God still comforts. The experience matters. God forced King Nebuchadnezzar to experience what he told him was true. And experience matters in large part because it manifests the truth. It gives force to the call to heed. And we are to heed this testimony. We are to heed this testimony. Remember, this is to all peoples, nations, languages in all the earth. God put this in the scripture for everyone. Christian, non-Christian, male, female, old, young, whatever your pigmentation, orientation, occupation, we are to know and live accordingly that God rules and humbles the proud. So how do we heed that? Well, we humble ourselves. We humble ourselves. Ostensibly, because we'd probably prefer that God didn't humble us directly in the same way, right? We humble ourselves. That could look like in a number of ways, but I'd like to focus on one. To be humbled is to be brought low. 
humbled and humiliated are from the same place. Right? It's to be exposed. Think about a city. In scripture or literature, if you said a city was humbled, what would you mean? It was conquered. It was laid bare. Its defenses were brought down. Its walls were brought down. To humble ourselves is to let our walls be broken down. To break down our own walls and be entered and exposed. Now, who's the invading force before whom we are most supposed to break down our defenses? Well, it's the living God and his word. Humble ourselves by exposing ourselves to the word of God. Read it. Meditate on it. Hear it preached. Hear it preached by several different people on the same text. I can cover some things, and I have a certain perspective. Another preacher or minister may have a different one. Hear it preached by people who aren't in your camp, however you might identify in your various camps. Right? Let ourselves be opened to how God might be speaking to us through his word. Assume that you do not know the extent to which it is talking to you. The Spirit exposes our prejudices and assumptions that he might heal them or take them away. He is a convictor. He will pierce us by the word. If you put your walls up to the double-edged sword of God, you find yourself trying to defend yourself against God. But let me contextualize this contemporarily for a moment in a way that I confess has made me uncomfortable. Okay? I used to serve with RUF at UVA up in Charlottesville. Okay? So I was immersed in college ministry in college campus culture okay? at a state university. And one thing that I began to hear more frequently over the past couple of years was a phrase in one way or another that sounded like this. Check your privilege. Has anyone ever heard that? Check your privilege. Maybe you've said it. I'm guessing maybe you've heard it. Maybe you've had it said to you. I confess that I have often reacted to this statement with scoff and scorn. Dismissal and dismay, not at myself, but at the culture, the culture, right, that is presenting it to me. I also confess that there might be some reason that I, there is to do that. But I need, as your pastor and a fellow follower of Jesus, to invite you to be humbled with me here. For here before us in Holy Scripture is not a neighbor or a student calling us to be woke. It is the living God telling us to wake up. He did not give a testimony of someone who suffered the consequences, did he not? He gave us the testimony of a con someone who suffered the consequences of not checking his pride, of not checking his power, of not checking his privilege before God. Of someone who was called to be aware of his power and influence, to promote and repress righteousness, his effect on the lives of his creatures, beasts, and man, to either oppress or flourish. And he ostensibly chose to remain ignorant, inconsiderate, unrepentant, and proud. This isn't the testimony of someone in persecution or poverty. Did you hear what he said? I was at ease in my house, prospering in my palace. 
And later, after he had been confronted on these things, what do we just see? The next thing of Nebuchadnezzar, well, I was walking around the roof of my palace. You've heard of the Hanging Gardens? This is the Hanging Gardens, okay? One of the wonders of the world. Well, I was walking up there admiring the majesty of my own might. On the backs of what Daniel points out is unrighteousness and a lack of mercy and depression. That's what afflicted him with pride. And thus God's humiliation. Brothers and sisters, there are a lot of voices out there. Some of them might not be correct in what they are accusing others or even yourself of. But some of them might be. Are we going to open ourselves and humble ourselves to voices that may call us to account? Or will we put up our defenses and our walls? Will we refuse to listen? Will we say it's only coming from certain sectors and thus must not be valid? Well, angels have come to people in Scripture in many a form. And King Nebuchadnezzar is a pagan king. If we are to take testimony from a pagan king to check ourselves, we should perhaps be more open to the people who are around us who might be calling us to check ourselves. Should we not err and heed, should we not heed Nebuchadnezzar and err on the side of humility and repentance? But you know what? We have a greater king to heed than King Nebuchadnezzar. And that's the second point. We have a far greater testimony in King Jesus. You know, it'd be one thing as a British subject, for example, to receive several notices from Her Majesty's government that you are delinquent in your duties and taxes. And then to receive penalties and fines and even hear of the punishments or penalties that come from a broadcaster on the BBC and decide not to heed it or to heed it and do whatever. But it'd be another thing, wouldn't it, to come home to your little apartment and, or flat, I could call it a flat, your little flat in London, and at your kitchen table is Elizabeth Regina sitting there. Mr. Smith, you are delinquent in your payments. Please pay, or I'll have to exile you. And if you do, we can enjoy tea. <laughs> right? It'd, be a di it'd probably be much, much more difficult than what I just said, but it would be something different, wouldn't it? Straight from the source, straight from the top, face to face. If Nebuchadnezzar can praise and extol God Most High as he knew him, how much more should we be able to praise and extol God as we know him, as revealed through Jesus Christ? For what does the scripture say? He, Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. By him are things created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is the radiance of of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. He has made him known. I mean, what do we say in the creeds? I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one essence with the Father. We believe that Jesus is God most high. Wow. 
What's more, Jesus is the king of heaven. Did you hear the scriptures just cited? All things were created for him. He is the king of heaven that Nebuchadnezzar extolled in verse 32. All authority in heaven and on earth are given to me, Jesus said. The angels in heaven proclaim that the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The apostles testify that Jesus is the son of David and David's Lord, the true heir and the true maker of the covenant promises of an everlasting kingdom of God's people. In this mystery, the unity of the kingdoms of earth and heaven are made in Jesus Christ. And that's why we confess again in the creeds, he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, and thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Jesus is the revelation of God most high, the one who rules the kingdoms, the one to whom they are given. But did you notice in verse 17, the last part of what the watchers said? To the end that the living may know that the Most High God rules the kingdoms of men and gives to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. Y'all, this is a place that one could tear. For you see, Jesus' testimony is not only superior because he is the Most High God who rules and he is the King of Heaven, who reigns over the kingdoms. His testimony is superior because he is the one who took on our flesh to willingly submit below every humiliation, to willingly submit under God's sovereignty. If experience matters, Jesus not only has all the truth, but the most experience. Our Lord Jesus is the lowliest of men. I mean, hear some of this from what the prophet Isaiah says about him. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. This is from Isaiah 52, 53, if you want to find this. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. How? How? Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told they, of them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. For he grew up before them like a young plant, like a root out of a dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that has brought us peace. He was oppressed and afflicted. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for this generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? That's what God says of Jesus. It's like what Paul wrote. And being found in human form, Jesus humbled himself by coming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at his name, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Amen? 
Jesus' exaltation as Lord came first through humiliation and that of the lowliest of mankind. To leave the riches and glory of eternity and deity, to be born in our flesh and shame, in genocide and poverty, to be rejected, betrayed, spurned, falsely accused, stripped, tortured, murdered for sins he did not commit and for sinners who did it to him. He humbled himself below the most humble. If you were struck by Nebuchadnezzar's humiliation, how much more Jesus is? If you were struck by Nebuchadnezzar's restoration, how much more Jesus is? He lifting up his eyes and lifting back to the throne, he was lifted up from the grave. Death could not even hold him. That's the only reason that we're here. Amen? Sorry, I didn't mean to yell. Okay. His throne, his court, his majesty, his praise is now far more exalted than Nebuchadnezzar's or any rulers or anything that we are building for ourselves than the heavens are above the earth. If we are to learn to humble ourselves before God from this king, this pagan king, how much more should we learn to humble ourselves before God from this king, from Jesus? And he did it for us. He did it for us. Christ did not humble himself merely for his own exaltation. He did it for ours. Now there is the judgment of this world, Jesus said. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And everyone, he says, who looks on the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. I will raise him up. I will raise her up. I will raise them up. He who was delivered for our trespasses was raised for our justification. And since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember the beginning of Nebuchadnezzar's letter? Peace be multiplied to you. King Jesus' peace is far better. For he bears the transgression of our oppressions that we afflict, and he redeems the suffering of the oppressions that are suffered. His cross is the meeting place of those. His cross is the place that we have peace with God and peace with one another. And it's because of that peace that we can have hope in humility, hope of glory. So back to that illustration of humility before, of the walls being brought down. If you want to humble yourselves with Jesus, if we want to humble ourselves with Jesus, we have to humble ourselves before Jesus. Let his words, his parables, his commands break you and remake you. Let us not be like the lawyer who said, well, who is my neighbor? seeking to justify himself. The lowliest of men gave him a very stern parable. Let us not be like the Pharisee who said, blessed are those who recline at the table in the kingdom of heaven, all the while keeping out those whom God has invited. Let us be like the leper, the children, the sick woman, the tax collector, the prostitute who came and humbled themselves before Jesus, hoping beyond hope that they might, he might heal them. Do you know what he did? He looked at them and he raised them up. Even though they were hurt and had all reason for disbelief, they came to him, and he went under them 
and pick them up. For he opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So in conclusion, I mean, we, we can trust Nebuchadnezzar's testimony, and we should. But if we trust it only in this life, if we trust that, well, maybe I should practice some humility because it might get me some greater glory. If we think that, well, maybe I'll just continue in it because I see lots of wicked prosper and I could just continue in it. Or I'll just try to hope that maybe the governments will change and there won't be so much oppression. We could continue to just trust like that. Or we trust in Jesus, who promises an eternal promise. He has appointed a day when he shall judge the world in righteousness. All will be resurrected to his judgment to be rewarded either for their ill or for their good. And no one will say to him on that day, what have you done? Or can stay his hand. There is a reckoning with all pride. And there'll be a reckoning for all humility to be lifted up. That's our hope. That's your neighbor's hope. If you would communicate it to them. So I leave you with this. Thinking of this vision of the tree that Nebuchadnezzar had, I can't but help but think of Jesus' revelation, the last chapter, the last scene of our holy scriptures. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing out from the throne of God and from the Lamb who was in the midst of it. On either side of the river was a tree of life, its twelve kinds of fruit yielding its fruit in its season. The leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and their names will be on his foreheads and they will have no need of light or lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign with him forever and ever. That's our hope of glory. Amen. Lord God, humble us that you might exalt us. We pray this in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.